Welcome to the sixth chapter on truth and proof in the logical foundations of cyberphysical systems textbook. What we've seen last time is actually something quite amazing. Dynamic axioms for rigorously reasoning about dynamical systems. What we will be doing in this chapter now is to augment these dynamic axioms for dynamical systems reasoning principles with whatever it takes to add full mathematical rigor into an actual proof system. Last time we've had a lot of rigor in our reasoning principles, but we haven't been very systematic about how to use them. What we need to do right now is add more systematic structuring mechanisms into our argument. Certainly, what is important in the proof system is that it really guarantees to have covered all the cases which is, of course, kind of subtle in cyberphysical systems, with all the many, oops, uncountably infinitely many, possible behaviors that they could have. Just think of what all the behaviors are when following a differential equation. The other part that's important in a proof system is that it guides our thinking in terms of which proof rules to apply, so that it's not just blind search, but that we're being helped in as systematic a way as possible. We will, of course, still continue to use the dynamic axioms for dynamical systems in very crucial ways. Because thinking back about the dynamical axioms that we saw, they're actually pretty amazing. They characterize each of the dynamical systems operators in terms of structurally simpler differential limiting logic formulas. And that was very helpful as long as we exactly knew how to use them. And that's where the question for today comes from. How do you best tie the individual inferences together to obtain a well-structured proof? And in fact, what is a proof to begin with? Turns out there's much more to proofs than just axioms. There's also proof rules that are meant for combining fragments of arguments together into a bigger proof. In other words, Proofs are the glue that holds axioms together into a single cohesive argument for which you justify the conclusion of the proof. For example, when we were proving quantum, the acrophobic bouncing ball, okay, admittedly single hop, but never you mind, we sort of seemingly applied axioms at random at all kinds of places in the formulas and then call it a day. That's fine when you look back at such a proof and appreciate how elegant and simple and beautiful it was, but it's not so helpful if you're trying to come up with such a quote-unquote random proof in the first place. So more guidance is helpful. Another part where we've been very informal is how to justify the resulting arithmetic, which if we continue to be informal about that, leaves plenty of room for subtle mistakes and correctness arguments. And we should never have subtle mistakes, nor any mistakes at all, when it comes to CPSs. So what we will be doing today is imposing more structure on proofs. For example, we'll learn what to do with the propositional connective, such as and, or, implication, and not. But also the first order quantifiers, such as for all and exists. We haven't seen anything about them yet. We'll also revisit the fundamental proof principles for dynamics that we saw and make them more systematic. Because, well, the axioms were just that, they were axioms. The, that's amazing because all of their instances are always valid, it's true in all states, uh, but the axioms didn't exactly tell us how they're meant to be used in order to make sure we actually make our reason easier. So we'll look into this today. On the modeling and control side, we will deepen our understanding of how discrete and continuous dynamics relate because we'll understand in more explicit, better, proof-informed ways how the discrete and continuous dynamics relate in the presence of evolution domain constraints, which we briefly talked about last time. On the computational thinking side, today's topic is really about not just reasoning for cyberphysical systems, which we saw in its beauty last time already, but also systematic reasoning for cyberphysical systems. 
to make sure that we really know what we need to do when we're trying to develop a proof for a system. And that's, of course, completely fundamental for having any chance at all of verifying cyberphysical systems models at an appropriate scale. For simple things like the bouncing balls, we could make do with what we had. But there's just no chance you're going to do the same thing for the full complexity of an aircraft without more rigorous structuring principles. In particular, we'll discover the pragmatic aspect of proofs, by which I mean how to use the axiomatics to justify the truth of syntactic expressions. And we'll also be structuring proofs and their arithmetic arguments. Our CPS skill side will be mostly de devoted to sharpening our analytic skills for cyberphysical systems, but we will also develop a slightly better intuition for the operational effects, in particular in terms of questions like in what order should we worry about operational effects and does that matter? For the logical trinity that you saw, today we're essentially adding an extra lag, the pragmatics, by which I mean in addition to the syntax, which is just defining the notation for the problems we can ask, the semantics which is defining what actually carries meaning. So what's the real or mathematical object that we're talking about? The axiomatics we saw last time, which internalizes um, the semantic relations um, between objects as universally useful syntactic transformations. Just think of the axioms. We had a logical syntactic axiom, which once and for all taught us that two logical formulas are always equivalent, so we can swap out one for the other in any art place. But none of what we saw so far told us how to pragmatically go about using the axiomatics to justify the syntactic rendition of semantic constructs. How do we even do a proof in the first place? In what order do we proceed? The axioms, well, they were equivalence axioms. They equated the truth of two logical formulas with one another. But should we use them from left to right, or should we use them from right to left? What makes things easier? Each of the axioms was an equivalence, which equates the truth values of two differential living logic formulas, but how are we supposed to use that? It's an equivalence, all right. It has two sides. Uh, is the left-hand side nicer? Is the right-hand side nicer? Should we use it to transform the left-hand side to the right-hand side? Should we always use the backwards direction? Should we use one of the implications? In other words, this pragmatics of how to go about doing proof search is one of the important concepts of today. For that, we will be looking at an extension of Gerhard Gensen's sequent calculus, which is basically a way of making proofs and arguments completely systematic. Sequence are these constructs for a finite set of formulas gamma and a finite set of formulas delta. The gammas are called antecedent, the deltas are called succedent. This sequent is just a way of normalizing what we know. Gamma, you should think of, as all the assumptions that we have available for our argument at this moment. And deltas, you should think of as all the alternatives that we're trying to prove. We're not trying to establish all of them. We're just merely trying to establish one of them. In other words, a sequent gamma turnstile delta is just an abbreviation for this logical formula that says the conjunction of all the formulas on the left-hand side, the antecedent, implies the disjunction of all the formulas on the right-hand side, the succedent. Think of it this way. In antecedent gamma, you may have assumptions such as the moon is a ball and the moon is big. And in delta, you may have a list of options you're trying to prove from that. For example, the moon is round or the moon is a square. Now, you certainly won't be able to prove both of those, that the moon is round and the moon is a square from these assumptions, uh, but one of them will do from the assumptions that the moon is big and the moon is a ball, because balls tend to be pretty round. 
in other words, the deltas are sort of the options that we still have available to for proving our arguments, and the gammas capture all the assumptions we presently have. Now, that's a sequent. What we do in a proof in sequent calculus is to systematically transform one sequent into other sequent. Using sequent calculus proof rules. The sequent calculus proof rules all have the shape that for some number n of premises, they have a sequent as the first premise and so on, and the sequent as the nth premise. And from these premises, a sequent calculus proof rule is concluding a sequent that is the conclusion. And we use these sequent calculus proof rules in a admittedly weird but historically logical way, bottom up. That means we reduce the question whether this sequent has a proof using this proof rule here that I write with this bar notation or inference rule to these sub-questions or sub-goals whether this sequent has a proof and so on and whether those sequences have a proof. And the idea is that in order to answer whether this sequence can be proved, I will instead ask myself whether this and that and that and that and that and that one can be proved. Having done so, if I have succeeded with the proof of this and so on and the proof of that, then we come back in our argument to make sure that if this has a proof and so on and these have a proof, that means if all the proof rules we used are sound, that these sequence all represent by this encoding valid differential analytic formulas. And that means that if all of these have a proof, sort of they're valid, then that sequence also has a proof. So is valid. Which of course is only the case if we don't use an arbitrary transformation as a sequence calculus proof rule, but only sound ones. The ones that say if all the premises are valid, so they're true in all states, then the conclusion is valid, so true in all states. Wait, when is a sequent valid? Well, that's actually already defined. Look at this one, for example. Gamma turns del delta is actually just a syntactic representation or normal form for a differential limiting logic formula of this shape. Conjunction of every formula on the left-hand side implies disjunction of all the formulas on the right-hand side. And for a differential limiting logic formula, of course, we already said when it's valid, it's valid if it's true in all states. So what we need to do now is develop specific proof rules. We will still use logical compositionality arguments as guiding principles to develop one proof rule for each operator or one proof rule for each shape that the formulas within gamma and within delta can have. Let's do just that. For example, we would need a proof rule that is called AND left for handling AND operators, so conjunctions on the left-hand side, so in the antecedent. What does that mean? That means we're asking ourselves, how do we prove a sequence that says We've got some assumptions gamma and an assumption P and Q, and we're trying to prove delta from that. Well, what do you do if you are assuming a conjunction P and Q? How can you say that in logically simpler, smaller ways? Well, assuming P and Q is, of course, the same as assuming P as well as assuming Q, in addition to the assumptions you already had and then still approving the same question delta from that. That means you're assuming conjuncts separately, which makes a whole lot of sense because if you're assuming that P and Q is true, you might as well assume that P is true and also assume that Q is true. And if you now keep on using the and left proof rule that you see here on the slide, for all the top-level AND operators of all the formulas that appear in the antecedent, for the top-level AND, the proof rule will be able to handle and simplify syntactically each and every one of them. Also, if a conjunctive formula 
and Q occurs within gamma because if this is a list of formulas or a set of formulas because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to assume the same thing twice, then we're implicitly able to always use the proof rule no matter what particular position it occurs in the antecedent. We're not allowed to use the same proof rule just because it occurs in the things we're trying to prove from that because that might be a different logical reasoning principle. But for example, that can handle all kinds of situations. Not this one. Because if our sequence is A or B and C, and from that we're trying to prove C, whether or not that will succeed is another question, but even if there is an AND in it, it's not on the top level of a formula in the antecedent, because the top level operator here is an OR, which means at some point we need to worry about, wait, how do we prove OR assumptions on the left-hand side? But first, let's ask ourselves, how would we, if an AND occurs on the right-hand side, in the succedent, how would we prove that P and Q is true? Hmm. What would you do as a mathematician? Well, from a bunch of assumptions gamma, you would prove that P and Q is true, ignore the deltas for now, by proving that P is true, from the exact same assumptions gamma, and by proving that also Q is true from the exact same assumptions. So you would be proving this sequent, and having done so, also prove the average sequent. Now what's with the delta alternatives that we could be proving as well? Well, here we're not actually trying to prove just P and Q. We're trying to prove P and Q, well, or any of the alternatives, really. So if we succeed with a proof of P and we succeed with a proof of Q, that's fine. We've proved P and Q or some other nonsense. But suppose we're succeeding with this proof only because we establish a proof of the other nonsense. Well, in that case, if we prove this other nonsense, delta, everything, all, all the other alternatives, in this sub-question and in that sub-question, then of course we've established a proof of that. In other words, proving conjunctions is what we would do by proving each of the conjuncts separately. Proving that P and Q is true requires a proof of P and a proof of Q, but we will keep all the other alternatives around just in case the proof of those proceeds better. Now, how would we prove a disjunction? Proving that P or Q holds true. Well, or maybe some other alternatives. How we do that is not that we proceed with a proof of P and independently proceed with a proof of Q, because then we even prove that P and Q is true. We're only trying to settle for proving P or Q. We could prove P or Q by proving P from our assumption scanner, but if we were to do that, then just like in constructive logic, we've basically committed to one of the two sides of the disjunction and proved precisely that. That will be unnecessarily complicated so in our classical logic, what we will be doing instead is to also accept the proof of Q instead of the proof of P, if that works. Ah, I said the magic word. I said OR. In other words, what we need to do here is it's also fine if we prove Q from that instead. And we already have something that keeps alternatives as managing whatever things we could be proving from our assumptions gamma. It's called the comma operator. Remember, the meaning of a comma on the right-hand side of a turnstile sequence is an OR, whereas the meaning of the comma on the left-hand side is an AND. And of course, if we keep any of the other options and succeed in the proof of those, that also still proves the things we already asked to prove, namely to prove from the assumptions gamma that P or Q is true, well, or the other alternatives. So our proof rule that we've got is right here. So that's the proof rule for proving a disjunction by splitting the disjunction into its separate parts in the exact same succedent because the comma in the succedent already has a disjunctive meaning. How will we then go about doing a proof in which we have a disjunction among our assumptions? Among our assumptions, we find that P or Q is true. 
Well, hmm. If among other things we assume that P or Q is true, and we're trying to prove delta from that, then we can't exactly proceed with a proof that what we're trying to establish delta follows from the assumptions gamma together with P because we don't even have P among our assumptions here. We merely have P or Q among our assumptions. So we know that, well, P is going to be true or Q is going to be true, but we can't commit to every side because we have no way of knowing. But we can do that again. Right? We can separately show from the assumption Q instead that delta also follows. So here's the proof rule. Assuming P or Q among our assumptions, and going for a proof that this together with other assumptions gamma allows us to establish delta from it, for that it suffices if we prove from the assumption P and the other ones that delta works out, and also from the assumption Q and the other ones that delta works out. Because whether the assumption P or Q was satisfied because it was the P side that was true, or whether it was satisfied because it was the Q side that was true, in both of those circumstances do we have a proof. In other words, the or left proof rule handles disjunctive assumptions by doing one proof for each of the assumed disjuncts. We, we can't know which one it is, but we'd have P or Q among our assumptions, so we know that one of them has got to be true, and we covered both the cases. Notice a bit of a duality here. The and left proof rule and the or right proof rule sort of kind of have the same shape, but the or left proof rule and the and right proof rule sort of kind of have the same shape. That's of course not a coincidence. You can think about why. Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, we've got proof rules that handle conjunctions, whether they occur on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, at the top-level position of one of the formulas, and we've got proof rules that handle the disjunctions, whether they occur on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, at the top level of a sequence. Now, you might run into other propositional operators at top level as well, and we've done that in our bouncing ball example even. There was an implication operator, but at this point, you see our program, that if we find one reasoning principle for each of the propositional logical operators that we could have, both on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, then we've covered all the ways of possibly reasoning about them. Well, let's go right ahead and worry about how do we prove an implication. An implication could occur on the right-hand side of the sequent, so somewhere in the succedent part. For example, P implies Q, well, or maybe some other alternative, which, of course, implicitly is read like so. How do you go about proving an implication that P implies Q? Well, if you want to establish that P implies Q, you would assume P and go off on the journey to prove Q. And that's easy to cover in sequent calculus by saying that from the extra assumption P together with the old assumptions gamma that we already had, we're now trying to prove Q from that. Well, or maybe one of the other things. Seemingly, it might look like we're assuming the P also here for proving the deltas, which would be kind of awkward. But if you think about it logically, we're not really doing that because we're merely trying to establish that P implies Q or the other deltas are true. So if we assume that P is true, then it suffices to convince ourselves that Q is true or one of the other deltas is true. Because if you think about it, if you ever end up in a situation where P is false, then you have already shown that P implies Q well, or instead delta works out because you have already shown that P implies Q works out because you have already shown that P is false. So this case is actually okay to assume the P here. 
In other words, the implies right proof rule proves an implication by assuming the left hand side and going on to prove the right hand side. Everything we need to do is assume an implication. So if we have P implies Q among our assumptions, how do we proceed with a proof of that? Well, if you have among your assumptions the statement that if something is a prime number, then you cannot divide it by four different numbers, then, you, well, you can continue to work with the assumption that you cannot divide it by four different numbers, but I guess you first go ahead and prove that something actually is a prime number, because otherwise it isn't true. Um, the number 60 you can divide by many different numbers, but it also isn't a prime number. So, how do we make use of an implication among our assumptions? We make use of it by first proving that what it assumes is actually true, and then going on to assume the right-hand side of it instead. Sure thing, because if we know P, well, then we can assume Q from now on, because we already did assume P implies Q among our assumptions here. Now again, I invite you to first worry about the case when the other alternatives delta is um, the empty set of formulas. But it also works out if you have other alternatives, because if you succeed with the proof of delta here instead and the delta here instead, then of course you can establish that. In other words, the implies left proof rule assumes the right-hand side of the assumed implication P implies Q, but only after it already succeeded with proving the left-hand side of it, while keeping the other alternatives open. Now, how do you prove a not? Proving that not P is true, or some other things, well, we might as well assume that P is true, and then proceed with a proof, for example, of a contradiction. If there are no alternatives delta, and this is the disjunction over the empty set of formulas, which is just false, just like the conjunction over the empty set of assumptions would be true. And so proving that not P is true from some assumptions is the same as, well, let's assume P and prove a contradiction from that, then I guess we prove not P classic logic. But the same thing also works out if we keep other alternatives around, because again, if we have succeeded in the proof of delta already, um, then also down here we've succeeded in the proof of delta, never mind the not P as one of the alternatives. You can also understand the not right proof rule just by reminding yourself about the meaning of the sequence, which is the conjunct on the left-hand side implies the disjunction of everything on the right-hand side, and then you see this duality. So you prove a not P by proving a contradiction, nor the other delta options from the assumption P. If you assume a negation, not P among your assumptions, well, then you can also just prove P, which is the opposite of not P, from the assumptions, because if you have a proof of P from your assumptions, then of course you also have a proof of a contradiction from the extra assumption not P. And the same thing also works out still if you have other alternatives delta instead of proving a contradiction from that. Again, I invite you to look at the implicitly implicative, conjunctive, and disjunctive meaning of sequence in order to understand these two proof rules. But overall, we're assuming a negation by proving its opposite form instead. Now, all of these proof rules, they handle logical connectives on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side of a sequent. Oops, we forgot about by implication, P if and only if Q, but P if and only if Q is also the same as P implies Q and Q implies P, so I guess it's already covered. But even if these now all structured our thinking, all of these proof rules applications from the conclusion at the bottom to the premises at the top, we'll keep on asking us questions and questions and questions and questions and questions, and we're never done with a proof. And that's kind of awkward. When are we actually done with proving a sequence? 
Well, of course, for soundness reasons, we should only be done with a proof of a sequent if it's really valid, so true in all states. When is that syntactically obvious? It's syntactically obvious that a sequence is valid if among our assumptions we find what we're trying to prove. And here's the proof rule for the job. If among our assumptions and the antecedent we find a formula P that we also find among the things we're trying to prove, then certainly does P follow from the assumption P, never mind what gamma did, and never mind whatever alternatives delta are there. And in fact, there's nothing left to prove by this identity proof rule. And in order to make sure in an actual proof that people realize we didn't just stop writing, but we're really done with the proof, we often mark them by a little asterisk. So, in a use of this proof rule, we would write up here that we're done with the proof, which we mark like so. Another proof rule is the logical cut proof rule invented by Gerhard Gensen, which, instead of, like all the others, basically make a case distinction on what logical formula we've got, proves that delta follows from gamma in a different way by first proving that a formula C follows from the assumptions gamma, and then assuming that C holds. Again, first I invite you to ignore this delta alternative here, and then the cut proof rule says that C follows from gamma, and if we assume C in addition to the assumptions we already have, then the original delta can be proved. And that's actually like a lemma. We first prove the lemma C, and then we assume within the rest of the proof. And that makes all the sense in the world. Now, let's worry about what happens if there's this delta here. Well, if we find a proof of this sequence, we have not really succeeded in showing that C follows from the assumptions gamma, because we could have come up establishing that delta is actually true, or one of the alternatives. And then we don't know that C is really true as well. But that's fine, because if we have established delta from these assumptions, then, well, we've established delta from these assumptions, um, and then we're done with this proof part as well. Now we're essentially done with all the propositional connectives, but let me just be very explicit about two that we won't usually use, but you should know about them. The true formula, the formula that's just syntactically true, so also semantically is always true no matter what state, how do we prove that? How do we prove that true is true from some assumptions? Well, we're already done with the proof, because the true formula is always true no matter what state we're in, so this has its own proof. What do you do if, if you find a true formula in the assumptions on the left-hand side? Well, you can't make use of the assumption that the formula true is true because it's not a very helpful formula because you didn't put any knowledge into establishing that the formula true is true. In other words, um, there isn't much you can do with the formula true that occurs among your assumptions. You can basically ignore it. We'll see later on how we do that in the proof rule directly. If we have the formula false among our assumptions on the left-hand side, then how do we prove that delta is true from the assumptions of the gamma and that false? Well, again, we're done, right? Because if among all the other things we're assuming, we're also assuming false, well, then anything follows from that because the formula false, by definition, is false never true in any of the states. So it's one of the, by definition, false assumptions. So we don't have a proof. <clears throat> How do we go about proving false on the right-hand side? So that's the false right proof rule. 
no, 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 hold on a moment. Uh, we're, we're never actually supposed to prove that false is true because the entire point is that the formula false is always false in all the states. So there is no way of proving false in, except in the cases where false is already among our assumptions. So, for example, the identity proof rule would enable us to prove false, but only if false is already among our assumptions. And of course, if we have false among our assumptions, then anything follows from that, even false itself does. Let's put these proof rules to some good use. So here's a logical formula that absolutely deserves a proof. Um, hold on a minute. It only deserves a proof if it's really valid, so it's true in all states. But that's what sound sequence calculus proof rules will be able to tell. So how do we go about proving it? First, we turn it into a sequent. So we add the sequent turn style in front of it and prove it from no assumptions. Notice we've got no assumptions when we're trying to prove this. What can we do with it? Well, the logical formula tells us what we need to do to prove it because its top level operator is the implication operator. And we, of course, prove implications that occur on the right-hand side by using the implies right proof rule, which proceeds by assuming the left-hand side to prove the right-hand side. So we've reduced the question whether this sequent has a proof to the question whether that simpler sequent has a proof. Why is that simpler? Well, because it has one less logical operator. And if we keep on deleting logical operators, at some point it's going to be really easy by the identity proof rule. Now, how do we prove this sequence now? Well, it has a conjunction on the right-hand side. How do we prove a conjunction on the right-hand side? By the AND right proof rule, which, what does it do again? It proves each of the conjuncts separately. So we will have to ask ourselves, does B greater than zero follow from the assumptions we used to have? And does the other formula follow from the assumptions we have? What do we do here? Now, we've got two sequences of sub-questions. On the left one, we really ran out of clever things to do on the right-hand side. So we look into our assumptions and find that our assumptions still have propositional structure. We're assuming a conjunction here. How do we proceed about proving a sequence in which we are assuming a conjunction but the AND left proof rule, because the AND is on the left-hand side. And the AND left proof rule, of course, assumes each of the conjuncts separately. So we assume this and we assume that to prove this. And what do we do now? We're done. Because among all of our assumptions, do we find what we're trying to prove? And that should be really easy by the identity proof rule. And we mark that we're done just to remind ourselves that we didn't forget to keep on writing just like we did over here by writing down the asterisk star here. So from b greater than 0, of course, b greater than 0 follows, even if we assume other things. Yeah, so we're done with the proof. Now we're not done with the proof. We're only done with one of the branches of the proof. And of course, the sequence at the bottom will only have a proof if the entire sub-questions that we're asking here have proofs. This one now does have a proof, but that one doesn't yet. So I guess we need to worry about this. We have a disjunction on the right-hand side. How do we prove a disjunction on the right-hand side? By the OR right proof rule, which just lists all the options separately. So proving that not v greater equal 0 or v squared less or equal 10 is the same as just you know proving that this or that follows from our assumptions. Now, we could be worrying further about the not operator on the right-hand side, but maybe you already see that it's more clever to think about the assumptions that we have here, because our assumption actually seems like it's including what we're trying to show here. So we can worry about how do we work off an assumption that is a conjunction well, if we have an AND on the left-hand side, then we prove that using the AND left proof rule, which uh, assumes the two separately. So we assume the left conjunct and we assume the right conjunct separately. And now it's real easy. 
Now, among our assumptions, we find what we're trying to prove. So by the identity proof, we're done. And now, indeed, every part of the proof is done. And that means, because each of the proofs we've used here was a sound proof rule, that if all the premises of the proof are sound, and actually there are none, right? Um, this is just a mark that we're saying when we don't have any more premises to be worried about. The empty set of premises is valid in every state because it, they don't even impose any conditions. So because they are, and because this was a sound proof rule, the conclusion is valid. And so its conclusion, because it was a sound proof rule, is valid. And its conclusion is valid because they are. Da, 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 da. The original question is valid if all of the proof rules were sound which is the next thing we should be worrying about. Right? We could have written down proof rules that were just nonsense. What does it mean again for a proof rule, for example, the and write proof rule to be sound? It means that if all the premises are valid, then so is the conclusion. Let's convince ourselves about that, that the conclusion is valid whenever all the premises are valid. We do that from the semantics. If we want to convince ourselves that this sequence is valid, we might as well assume that all the formulas in gamma are true in a state omega that we are considering. Because if in that state one of the assumptions in gamma is not true, then the entire sequence is already true because it says, if all kinds of things are true that aren't true, well, then any arbitrary thing follows. Remember, the meaning is an implication. And we might as well also assume that in this state, none of the formulas on the right-hand side, delta, is true. Because, again, if one of them would already be true, uh, our overall implication meaning, which has a disjunctive meaning of the comma on the right-hand side, would already be true. So it's really only interesting if we are in a state where all the gamma assumptions are true and none of the delta assumptions are true. And now we really need to establish that P and Q is true in the state omega. But that we cannot possibly show without looking at the only thing we've got, the premises. So by premise, we know, in particular in this state omega that we care about, that this sequent is true, or rather the logical formula that is corresponding to this, the one that says, conjunction of all the left-hand side implies disjunction of everything on the right-hand side. And likewise, well, this is valid. So it's also true in the particular state of omega. Now, by what we assume without loss of generality here, all the gammas are true in the state of omega, but none of the deltas is. So the sequent can only be true in the state if p is also true true in the state. And this can only be true in the state if Q is also true in the state. That means, by this left premise, do we know that in the particular state omega does P have to be true? And by the right sequence, do we know that Q has to be true? Well, and then we of course know that their conjunction P and Q is true, because that's the very meaning of conjunction, remember? The set of all states where P and Q is true is just the intersection of the set of all states where P is true with the set of all states where Q is true. So both P and Q are true in the state omega, so is the conjunction. Well, and that of course means that the sequent that we're trying to establish is true in the state omega. And hey, that state of omega was completely arbitrary in our argument, so of course it works for every state omega, so the sequent is valid. In similar ways, of course, it doesn't suffice to just convince us that the end right proof rule was a sound one, but all of the proof rules we ever doped have to be sound. And then we're able to prove the theorem of soundness of sequent calculus that every differential limiting logic formula with a proof is actually valid. And this, of course, is very important. Imagine you're going off on a journey to find a proof for your favorite type of good system. And you do that, you write down something that claims to be a proof because you use all kinds of proof rules, and you find out that regardless, the conclusion at the end isn't really valid. That would be very annoying and really awkward because you would have just proved something counterfactual and would have established the safety of a system, signed off on it, 
without it actually being safe, that's very bad. But in logic, we can convince ourselves that indeed every time we say there is a proof, the conclusion of it is really valid. But how do we prove this soundness theorem? Well, every differential limit logic formula with a proof is supposed to be valid, but how do we prove differential limit logic formulas in sequent calculus? Well, by first converting them into a sequent and then having all kinds of assumptions on the left and all kinds of formulas on the succit on the right. And so in other words, what I'm trying to say is that the way to prove a differential limit logic formula is by way of working with its sequent version, and then they will internally again work with sequent versions. In other words, what we need to do is to prove in a slightly stronger form of soundness, namely that not just every differential limit logic formula with a proof is valid, but every differential limit logic sequent with a proof is valid. So if there's a proof of a sequent, then the sequent represents a valid formula, which we do prove, and that's the beauty of logic, by induction on the structure that the sequent calculus proof has. We know the shape of the sequent calculus proof. It's gonna be some set of proof rules applied in a bunch of places. And we know all the proof rules. We wrote them all down. Admittedly, only the ones for propositional logic so far, but we should first understand soundness of the propositional case. Well, we could have started from nothingness, right? We could have started with the simple most proofs, the ones that don't use any proof rules, which are just the ones that are axioms, because differential and logic axioms on the only things we can prove without using any proof rules. We just, we've seen last time that each of the differential and logic axioms is sound, which means all their instances are valid formulas. And, well, valid formulas are valid formulas even if you write a sequent calculus symbol in front of it. So that's easy. It could have been a proof that consists of having applied a sequent calculus proof rule so here's one proof rule step. There could have been more here, could have been more here, but at least this one proof is smaller than the entire proof, and this one proof is smaller than the entire proof because both the proof on the left and the proof on the right and everything in between are missing at least one proof rule application. Now, by induction hypothesis, this has a smaller subproof. So if it has a proof by induction hypothesis, this is a valid sequent, and so is that. Now, all the proof rules we could have been using in sequent calculus for differential limit logic are individually proved sound. We saw one proof for the and left proof rule right now, but of course we also have done proofs for all the other sequent calculus proof rules. And that means soundness, remember, if all the premises are valid, which we just established by induction hypothesis, then the conclusion is valid. And that's precisely what we were trying to say. That every differential limit logic sequent, for example, that one, with a proof, for example, this one, is valid. That means from now on until eternity, of course, we have to make sure that absolutely every axiom and proof rule that we adopt first need to prove sound. But then we've got a completely compositional soundness argument for every proof, no matter how big we make it, it could be a terabyte of a proof. Each and every one of the axioms was a sound one, and we have a finite list of axioms. Last time we saw on the order of 10 or so. And each and every one of the proof rules, well, now we saw maybe 20 or so, also is sound. That means everything is preserving validity. If the premises are valid, then so is the conclusion, which is what we're interested in. All right, so what have we got? We've got proof rules for ands and ors and all the propositional connectives, but we don't have proof rules for any other operators. In particular, we don't have proof rules for modalities. Well, so I guess we've got left and right proof rules for positional connectives, so we should be doing left and right proof rules for all the other top-level operators, in particular all the modalities, in particular uh, all the top-level operators within the modalities. 
so I guess let's march right on. We need to develop a proof rule for proving that all behavior of a system that has a choice between alpha and beta is safe. How do we do that? Well, if you want to show that, I guess we need to show that all the alpha behavior is safe and independently all the beta behavior is safe. That makes sense to us. What do we do if we find the same formula in our assumptions? The formula that says all behavior of alpha choice beta are safe. Well, we need a proof rule for the box choice operator occurring on the left-hand side. What do we do? Well, we also say that we work off this assumption by instead assuming that all the alpha runs are safe and separately assuming that all the beta runs are safe. Of course, they're saying the same thing. You notice something? That's incredibly boring because we already know all of this from just the differential logic axiom of non-deterministic choice that says, never mind what context, all runs of alpha choice beta are safe if and only if all the alpha runs are safe and independently all the beta runs are safe. The two formulas are equivalent. Whether they occur here on the right-hand side of the sequence or whether they occur on the left-hand side of the sequence, or in fact whether they occur anywhere at all. Speaking of anywhere at all, these two proof rules, we could be adopting them, but then we cannot use them in another logical context, such as the one we find after a differential equation. Just look at this. After this differential equation for the bouncing ball, we really wanted to split this non-deterministic choice because it makes our reasoning easier. But this proof rule will not apply here. It's not of the form that one of the formulas on the right-hand side, well, there is only one, it starts out with a box choice. No, it does not. It starts with a differential equation. So the other one, of course, cannot apply to this either unless we happen to find this in the assumptions A, which we don't because these are arithmetic assumptions in this case. In other words, not only would it be very annoying to develop a right and left proof rule for each of the modality operators and each of their top-level operators, but also we wouldn't exactly learn a whole lot of new things because we know all of these things from the differential and logic axioms of dynamics already, and the proof rules would be less powerful. So instead, what we do is we institutionalize the principle of substituting equals for equals. Well, all right, substituting equivalent formulas for equivalent formulas. Um, so if in any context we find the formula P, and we know by proof that P and Q are equivalent, for example, like here, then we might as well, in this context, replace the occurrence of the formula P by instead the formula Q. And we can do that not just when P occurs in any arbitrary context on the right-hand side, we can also do the exact same thing when P occurs in any arbitrary context on the left-hand side of the sequence. If P and Q are equivalent, then it doesn't matter whether we mention P or Q. This is really the intuitive principle of substituting equals for equals in the case of logical formulas. For example, here we can prove by the non-deterministic choice as the thing that's underlying it. By the non-deterministic choice, this is equivalent to that. And because the blue formula, which we've got here, is equivalent to the green formula, which we've got there, then of course it doesn't matter which one we mentioned. So by the contextual equivalence principle, if we use this equivalence right here, we can write the green right-hand side instead of the left blue-hand side. Reminder, for this to be sound, it is, of course, super important to really have a proof that P and Q are equivalent under no assumptions. Because in the middle of some logical formula context, such as the right here, we have no way of knowing whether our assumptions are still true. But that's precisely what we've got from the axioms of differential and logic. Each of them is an equivalent. So let's make use of that. Here's an admittedly still super boring um, differential and logic formula, but at least it's got some programs in it. So what we need to do here is use the sequential composition axiom. 
Yeah, we also have to use the contextual equivalence proof rule, but we usually just elide the mention of that. Because this formula down here, here it goes, is equivalent to that formula up here, here it goes, by an instance of the sequential composition axiom. Of course, it doesn't matter whether you mention the left-hand side or the right-hand side of this equivalence, so you can very well replace the left-hand side in any context, there's not a whole lot of context here, by the right-hand side. And we will only say it was because of the sequential composition axiom. We wouldn't usually even write this down. Next, here we can handle the assignment axiom. So this formula up here is equivalent to that formula down there by an instance of the assignment axiom. Notice the occurrence of A, all of them in here are replaced by the right-hand side minus B. In this particular case, we leave this assignment in here, but we could have worked in the other order. Just think about how you would do that. And then the only remaining modality is handled again by an assignment, where again, by another instance of the assignment axiom, this formula here by the assignment axiom is equivalent to that formula right there. And so it doesn't ma matter what we mentioned, the left-hand side or the right-hand side. And now we can simply copy-paste the proof we already had before, because it, coincidentally, the remaining sequence that we have right here is just the propositional logic we already saw. Copy paste. Slight twist mm, here and there. We don't quite have the exact same arithmetic form. In other words, we will also need to start to learn to reason about real arithmetic. But we already glue the previous propositional proof with this little tiny bit of arithmetic together with the dynamics proof that we have right here to have a pretty rigorous proof of this differential in Arctic formula. Good. So we've seen proof rules for almost all the logical operators for and or implication and so on, but also for the modalities, box and diamond for all the cases, using the dynamic systems axioms that we already saw last time. But we're still missing two. One of them is the universal quantifier, the other one the existential quantifier. But let's follow the same guiding principle of designing them. A proof rule for the right-hand side occurrences, and a proof rule for the left-hand side occurrences in a sequence. How would we go about proving for all x, p of x is true? Let's remember what we would do as mathematicians. In order to prove that p of x is true for all x's, we would just prove it for an arbitrary y and prove that p is true for y, where y was really arbitrary. But we have to make sure that the variable y we choose to prove it for is really new. It's really arbitrary, and that means in particular it cannot possibly occur in either gamma or delta or for all x, p of x, not free at least. So we need to choose a fresh variable about which we cannot possibly know and silently assume anything because we've never used it before. For example, if you want to show that for all x, is x squared is greater or equal to zero, you would choose an arbitrary y and show that y squared is greater equal to zero, and then walk back and say, yeah, but y was arbitrary, right? So of course that works for all x's as well. But it was important that y was arbitrary, fresh variable about which we don't know anything. It's not sufficient to just prove it for your favorite numbers zero and then walk away with a conjecture that it works for all of them. How would you prove an existential quantifier on the right-hand side? that there is an x set at p of x. Well, if we're trying to prove that there is an x such that p of x, we would just mm, give the witness for the x that apparently exists. So some term e, which can mention anything at once, and prove that p is true of e, and because p is true of this very term e, of course there is an x such that p of x. It's well, this E, but we just kind of forgot about it. Where this E can be an arbitrary term that serves as the witness. Imagine if you're trying to establish that there is a number whose cube is less than its square, a mathematician would choose a witness, 1 over 2, for example, 
and prove it for that. How do we now work with a universal quantifier in our assumptions with the for all left proof rule? Well, if somebody tells you among your assumptions you get to assume p of x for all x's, then I guess it's okay to also assume it for a very particular term e, because after all, if we assume that p of x is true for all x's, then it should definitely be true for the term e as well, that we made up arbitrary. In other words, assumptions for all variable values also imply that we can assume them for one arbitrary one that we made up. How do we work with an existential quantifier in our assumptions? So if we assume, among other things, gamma, that there is an x for which p of x, well, then we can assume that p holds for something, but we really shouldn't assume anything specific about the something. In other words, we're again in a situation where we can might as well assume that p is true of y, but it's got to be a fresh variable y that we haven't seen, or at least haven't seen free in what we've got here, gamma, delta, and there is an xp of x. Because after all, if somebody tells you, well, there is a number whose cube is less than its square, then, you know, you can't say, oh, okay, let me assume that was 17, because it's not very true for 17. But it's okay to say, let me call this number that apparently exists whose cube is less than its square. I might as well call it y and work with this assumption about the y that I don't know anything about. And this finishes up sequent calculus proof rules, all of them. And notice for the quantifier proof rules, it was actually very important that soundness means that the conclusion is valid if all the premises are valid. For example, up here, it is important that it was valid, which implicitly says it's true in all the states, and that really actually already implicitly says it was true for all the values of the variable y, which is sort of where the for all x comes in as well. Let's use those sequent calculus proof rules for something good. Here's a bouncing ball. And in order to do a sequent calculus proof, uh, well, we turn it into a sequent and first handle the implication by pushing the assumptions into our antecedent and proving the right-hand side. And from now on, well, basically the proof is the exact same thing that it was already in the previous lecture when we were just working with dynamic systems axioms because all we need to do is convert every time we mentioned implication into, well, now I guess we're in the middle of a sequence, but other than that, nothing really changes. If we do this more carefully, here we use an axiom to replace the left-hand side of an axiom by the right-hand side of an axiom. So the right is equivalent to this formula, which occurs here. Um, then we use a choice axiom instance, again, now in the middle of it, this side is equivalent to that side, so we can also replace it in any context. Leave that alone. Here, then, the sequential composition. This is equivalent to that by the sequential composition axiom, so we can also re write one for the other in any context. Um, here, the tests are being handled, and now, finally, the differential equation is being handled, and now the resulting um, assignments here can be handled after first splitting the assignments in the sequential composition by an axiom instance and then putting the assignments in and putting the values in and, and, and so on. Now we're left with the exact same arithmetic that the bouncing ball already had before and just observe that we were now following a structure of a proof more explicitly that we followed almost incidentally in the previous chapter. All of this structures the logical structure of the reasoning very well, but it doesn't tell us a whole lot yet about what we do with real arithmetic questions that come up. Let's give them a thought. For real arithmetic, we're using a gigantic logical miracle by Alfred Tarski, who almost a century ago proved that first of the logic of real arithmetic is decidable. So if we have a sequent with it, antecedent gamma and succeedent delta, and 
the formula here it is that this sequent represents so conjunction of all the formulas on the left hand side implies disjunction of all the formulas on the right hand side if that formula here is first of all just a formula and first or the logic of real arithmetic and also a valid formula so it is true in all the states then we simply write down by real arithmetic are we done with the proof of course it is really important that the side condition that we have here really can be implemented, but it can be implemented by this miracle that Alfred Tarski came up with, that real arithmetic versus the logic is actually decidable. There's an algorithm for it. So, for example, here, well, first of all, this is just arithmetic, and second of all, it's a valid formula. So, by real arithmetic, we're done with the proof right here. Just like over here, this is just arithmetic, so uh, we're done with the proof. No, 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 no. That was too fast. That is actually not correct because it is arithmetic, all right, but it still has to be valid formula arithmetic. And this formula is not valid under all circumstances just because if x squared is greater than zero it does not imply that x is greater than zero. It just implies that x is greater than zero or x is less than zero. In other words, this actually would be false to use a real arithmetic. Don't do it in the wrong way. And the miracle here is that Tarski proved quantify elimination. There is an algorithm that computes for every first order logic formula P an equivalent formula that has no quantifiers. And the two are really equivalent, meaning P is equivalent to QE for, of P is a valid formula under all circumstances. And it doesn't even mention more variables free than it used to mention before. Um, yeah, okay, that's cool. But what if there are no quantifiers? It's not, I mean, up here there are none. And so it's not completely clear how Tversky's quantum elimination miracle applies, but it does. And here's the reason why, because we can introduce the universal closure using an inverse universal quantifier proof rule that basically says, one way of proving that P follows from a bunch of assumptions is to prove the more fancy statement that for all X, P is provable from the assumptions. Because sure, if we prove P for all Xs, we also will have proved that for whatever particular variable X we had down here, possibly with some assumptions. So whenever we need to, we can dream up universal, not existential, but we dream up universal quantifiers because it if anything, it makes the proof harder, not easier. So for example, here in this circumstance, here we've got a universal quantifier, so maybe you could think that you should use quantitative elimination for the job, but that's not the case because it's not really first of the logic of real arithmetic that we have here. It still has modalities with hybrid programs in them, and it would be a bit much to expect from poor Alfred Tarski that he handles all of your cyberphysical systems questions for you. But We've got the other proof rules for universal quantifiers. The ones that say proving a universal quantifier, we do that by just dreaming up an arbitrary value. We can still call it D because we have no assumptions about D here. And prove it for this arbitrary value. Then we can, for example, work on the choice with the axiom of non-deterministic choice. Then work on the assignments here and work on the average assignment there. And now we've got real arithmetic. Um, well, if we're strict about it, Alfred Tarski can eliminate quantifiers. We have got none, but we can introduce them again. By the inverse quantifier rule, we can dream up a universal quantifier for D. Well, we can also dream up a universal quantifier for X, which was never there before. And now we have a formula where every variable is quantified. And because Alfred Tarski can perform quantitative elimination on this, and give us back a logical formula that's equivalent but with no additional variables means that the only formulas that Arthur Tarski could be handing back to us are the ones that don't mention any variables and if they don't mention any variables all we need to do is evaluate things like whether 7 is greater than 0 and stuff like that which means we will be able to find out whether that formula is true or false because it cannot depend on the state anymore. And in this case, it is actually true, so we will be able to prove that just by real arithmetic. Notice, 
we could actually also have just left the poor for all the alone and just work in the middle of it right away and then we spare ourselves the uh, detail of having to reintroduce the universal quantifiers. Now, real arithmetic decidability is a big miracle of logic, but its complexity of the algorithms that decide it isn't amazing. In other words, oftentimes it can be very important to simplify in logic the arithmetic questions before you proceed. One of the techniques to logically simplify real arithmetic questions will simultaneously enable us to practice quantifiers and learn something useful about differential equations. Namely, when we're giving a question about a differential equation, x prime equals f of x within the evolution domain constraint q of x, does a postcondition p hold afterwards? And in order to prove that, we can solve the differential equation using the solution axiom, which will enable us to work on a universal quantifier. By the for all right proof rule, we prove a property for all times t by proving it for any arbitrary time t, assuming we haven't used t here. Then we can uh, use the implication proof rule to assume the left-hand side t greater equal to zero to prove the right-hand side. Th then we can again use the implication right proof rule to move this assumption on the assumption stack as well. Now we have an assumption for all intermediate times s between zero and t. Is the evolution domain constraint q true for the value that the solution y has at this intermediate point in time s? And of course, one thing we can do with it is use the for all left proof rule to instantiate this intermediate point quantifier for some helpful time. What do you think is the most interesting point in time where the evolution domain constraint is true? The one we're at right now, right? We're currently at time t, so that's the most fascinating one to be able to learn something about whether the evolution domain constraint is true at that moment. So let's insert the concrete time t that we're interested in for s, wherever there used to be s, now there's t. Then work with the implies left proof rule to prove the left-hand side of an implication we assume, and then walk away with the assumption of the right-hand side. Proving that this is true is actually very easy because, well, we are already assuming t greater equal zero, so proving its conjunction that zero is less or equal t is easy, and proving the other conjunction implicit here that t is less or equal t is also easy just by trivial reflexivity arithmetic. That leaves us with only the left-hand side to be worried about. Of course, without knowing more about what gamma and q and p and y are, we cannot possibly succeed with a proof of that. But we walk away with the inside that this proof could always be done if we have a solution, so we summarize it with a derived proof rule that says, if we would like to prove this, we might as well prove the only one remaining question, namely that one up here, of course, under the usual assumptions for solutions, namely that y actually is a solution of a differential equation and starts from the appropriate symbolic initial value and t is a new time variable and all that sort of thing. But this now is a different style of justifying why a proof rule is okay. It's not one that we have to bake in and convince ourselves with the semantics that it is right. It is a proof rule that we simply read off by mix and matching other proof rules and axioms together in order to succinctly summarize what we've learned this way around. And now, when we look at the remaining derived proof rule, it tells us that if we're trying to prove a box property of a differential equation with an evolution domain constraint q. And of course, the evolution domain constraint actually has to hold at all the moments in time, but it is okay for a proof to merely work from the assumption that the evolution domain constraint q is true at the end time t that is arbitrary, when that suffices in order to prove the post condition. And yeah, this instantiation that we did down here of a quantifier actually is helpful because it saves work for the real arithmetic quantifier elimination.
because, hey, we eliminated it by instantiating it appropriately. So this can be a very helpful idea in your proofs to manage proof complexity of real arithmetic as well. Another thing that can go wrong in arithmetic is that you have a ton of stupid assumptions. Some of them are very clever even, but the arithmetic question you have is just like in the case you saw a moment ago, a very easy one. From the assumption that r is greater than zero, it's pretty easy to prove that zero is less or equal to r, oh, and also r is less or equal to r, which has nothing much to do, if anything at all, with the additional assumptions a that you have available. Remember, your proof in sequent calculus is carefully managing exactly the set of assumptions that you have available. It is not telling you which of them are useful. If you have a very complicated arithmetic formula, that can be a big distraction to the real arithmetic decision procedure. Just This is essentially Occam's assumption razor. Think of it, how hard it would be to prove a theorem if you have all the facts and all the books of mathematics available as your assumptions. It's going to be a gigantic implication with lots of assumptions, and they're not helpful compared to trying to do a proof if somebody gives you just the two facts that actually matter for your argument. So, by using your intuition and insights about the CPSs you're designing, you can make the arithmetic a lot more scalable by deleting assumptions, which is always okay, by the weakening left proof rule, the one that says, in order to prove that from the assumptions gamma as well as p, delta follows, it suffices to prove that already just from the assumptions gamma does delta follow. It's okay to delete assumptions. It's just not a great idea to dream them up because that would be unsound. Likewise, with the weakening right proof rule, is it okay to delete alternatives that we are trying to establish on the right-hand side? The thing in the top is always a bit harder to prove than the things in the bottom. But here it's actually easier computationally, even if magically we made assumptions disappear, which makes it seemingly harder. It's computationally a lot easier. Another thing we can do to help arithmetic along is abbreviate terms to reduce the complexity. Here is some arithmetic, and well, it may or may not be true, it's hard to see, but notice here the exact same fancy complicated term is appearing a bunch of times. If we simply call this term z, give it a new variable name, then the remaining arithmetic is just that. We've got some arithmetic distractions, but it is already easier because all that we are asked to do now is from the assumption that 0 is less or equal to z, and z is less or equal to v, and d is less or equal to 8, to prove by transitivity that z is less or equal to 8, which is comparably easy. And it can be very easy for arithmetic procedures to see if it is presented like so, and very hard if it is hidden behind very complicated arithmetic expressions instead. We will not now develop a proper proof rule for introducing such abbreviations, even if you're already welcome to use them in your proofs, because that will be a topic of a later chapter, 12 to be precise. But in order to just give you a hint of how this works, this is actually an inverse of a derived proof rule that also is useful, one that turns assignments into equations. So, you know, there's another way of handling that we assign the value of the term e to the variable x and prove that p is true of x is to assume the equation that y is equal to e and then instead prove that p is true of y. Where, of course, for soundness reasons, it is extremely important that y, again, is actually a new variable. Just think of how awkward it'd be if our assignment here would be x assign x plus 1 and then we would have as our assumptions x equals x plus 1 is really impossible of an assumption. But if y is a fresh variable, basically denoting the new or static single assignment form value for the variable x, then it's sufficient to prove that p is true of y. This proof rule can sometimes be useful, but it's already derived. Another thing you can do to simplify arithmetic is to use a creative cut. So a cut like Gerhard Gensen, prove a lemma and then use a lemma, but you use it in a clever way to dream up arithmetic that simplifies your questions. Think of it this way. If you're trying to prove this, ordinary propositional logic proof rules turn it into that question, and now you have, among your assumptions, that x minus y squares less or equal to zero, and some big and fancy formula p of y, and a big and fancy formula p of x that you're trying to prove from that. Now, that can be hard, 
but a clever arithmetic insight would lead you to observe that, wait a minute, if x minus y squared is less or equal to zero, then of course x has to be equal to y. So you prove with the cut the lemma that x is equals y, and then assume the lemma that x is equals y in the rest of the proof. How you do the left-hand side premise is by deleting all the arithmetic distractions that are not of significance of the proof. First, that is a question that's irrelevant of what the assumption p of y is, so let's delete it away. And it's also a question that's irrelevant of what the other alternatives p of x is on the right-hand side. And all of a sudden, this arithmetic is a piece of cake to prove by a decision procedure. But now we've established that x equals y is an okay assumption to be using. Now we delete away the higher degree assumption, x minus y squared is less or equal 1, to just have p of y together with x equals y. And from that we're trying to prove that p is true of x. And now we have proof rules for handling equations. For example, the one that says if we have x equals e among our assumptions on the left-hand side, then proving p of x can be reduced to instead proving p of the right-hand side e. Sure, if they're assumed to be equal, we can replace equal with equals. And likewise, if that replacement has to be done on the left-hand side on the antecedent. So here, well, we use the equality right proof rule to say, well, but since we do assume that x is equal to y, it doesn't matter whether we say p of x here or p of y here. And all of a sudden, the identity proof rule is able to do that, which is, of course, much easier than having to ask a monster arithmetic decision procedure for the job. Notice this arithmetic simplification hinged on the fact that we observe something clever that we prove first and then assume from that point forward. We can arithmetic distractions out of the way. Let's summarize what we've learned in this chapter. We've seen proof rules for sequent calculus. They have a proof rule left and right for each of the operators. For the right proof rules in the succedent, these are proof rules for proving that a formula of this particular shape is true. For example, P and Q we prove by proving that P is true and separately proving that Q is true. Even if we have the exact same assumptions, gamma is still available. And even if we have the exact same alternatives, delta is still available. There's also a proof rule for each of the operators for their occurrence on the left-hand side. For example, again, if among our assumptions we find P and Q, well, then we can proceed with a proof by just splitting the conjunction into two separate assumptions and assume the old assumptions gamma together with just the left conjunct p and the right conjunct q because that's sufficient. All of these are actually very easy logical operations um, with a bit of attention for the quantifier proof rules. For example, I'm going to prove that for all x, p of x, we have to actually dream up a new variable y that didn't occur free in what we had before and prove it for this new arbitrary y that p is true of y. The only Slightly different proof rule is the one for real arithmetic, which says, well, we're just left with real arithmetic, and that formula that this sequence corresponds to, conjunction of the left-hand side implies disjunction of the right-hand side, is a formula of first-order logic real arithmetic, and is a valid formula. Check that always carefully, meaning it is true in all the states. Then we're done with the proof as well. And we've seen management techniques to reduce the complexity of real arithmetic proofs as well by exploiting the other logical reasoning principles. We also continue to use, quite crucially so, the dynamical systems axioms that we've seen in the previous chapter to reduce and simplify one step at a time all the modalities with hybrid programs in them such that because we now have ways of simplifying all the propositional operators, ways of simplifying all the quantifiers, ways of simplifying the box and diamond modalities from last time, and even ways of proving the arithmetic at the end of the day. We now have all it takes to prove cyberphysical systems properties. With one caveat, remember how the loops were complicated? We'll get back to that.
us next time. And remember that so far we only learned what to do with solvable differential equations, but not all differential equations have simple closed term solutions. We'll get back to that right after some modeling exercises.